Hi, this is Quarantine Conversations number nine. I'm speaking with Jason Sylvester, a.k.a. Diogenes of Mayberry. Hi, Jason. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. So we're going to be discussing today the Enlightenment and the assertion that the modern Western world is built on Christian va Christian values and not the Enlightenment. I know you've done a lot of work in this area, and I've done some as well. So it'll be an interesting conversation. Uh, we're both uh, involved in AAI, the Atheist International a lot, Atheist Alliance International that just started back up, and reorganized. So uh, involved in that. And uh, Jason, you live in uh, Hong Kong. That's that was really interesting. Uh, how how was it living there? Uh, expensive. Expensive. <laughs> I and imagine. Human. Is the culture a lot different from? Oh you yeah. Know, yeah. Is yeah, it a lot more it's, secular? It's, it's fun. Yeah. Well, there's it's there's been some not problems, but there's there's a lot of the the civil servants. Some of the senior civil servants are evangelical Christians, so there's been some buzz around that. But it, the the government itself is pretty secular. Right. Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories coming out of there. I've been to Japan myself, and I. I almost cried when I had to leave. I, I really, really loved it. Um, and Japan, of course, is one of the most secular countries in the world and, and one of the healthiest. Um, but Jason, talking about this assertion, you know, that um, the West is built on Christian values. The uh, I wrote a paragraph kind of summing up the main points for me uh, against that. And I write, uh, Western values come from Judeo-Christian principles. But Christianity is all about obedience and authority, even submission to worldly authority, which is assigned by God, not freedom. It's God as a tyrant. Scripture says nothing about democracy. And Christian history is one of massacring people for incorrect views and in no way preaches freedom of religion. And Christianity has, and the Bible does, subject women and condone slavery. It commands faith, not questioning, contrary to science and philosophy, and it condemns affluence and striving for wealth while preaching to stay in your station in life quite contrary to capitalism. The focus and the goal is the next life, not the betterment of this life in this world. So what do you have to say about that, Jason? Um, this claim that the West is built on Christian or Judeo-Christian values. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of yes and no. Um, one of the, some of the, there's a, a Bible series, or a series, a documentary called The Bible on Earth that was based on the, on the book uh, by Israel Finkelstein right. and uh, Neil Silberman. And in the documentary that they did, um, one of the professors, um, Baruch Halpern, uh, was mentioning that Deuteronomy was kind of the rejection of um, tradition and sort of the birth of civil rights. And so mm. in... in in Deuteronomy, you have this, this new function that the citizens have rights, uh, but they also have responsibilities. So in that sense, there's, there's, you know, you can say Western values can maybe come from, have built on that. But this idea that um, morality is somehow based in, in, in any religion or in Judeo-Christianity, uh, I mean, that's just, that's just, you know, a fallacy. Uh, right. Obviously, our moralities predate all of all of organized religion. So the, you can't say that these these religions encoded these beliefs that were, you know, pre-existing long before that. So, right. Well, you know, you look at the Old Testament; it doesn't smack of civil rights. You know, it it includes you know massacring peoples, and you know, women don't really have any rights. I mean, the Bible really repudiates equal rights and if you look at the first commandment you know worship no other god before me that's kind of the opposite to western laws and institutions and values which are based on freedom of religion so and it's you know full of thought crime you know and the death penalty for thought crime and things like that all, all this runs completely counter to to western laws and so we do have in greek culture classical antiquity you know we have uh the Stoics had an idea of universal rights and, and cosmopolitanism. And uh, there were, in the classical world, you can find a lot of the roots of the ideas that took hold in the Enlightenment. And they were kind of rediscovered in the Renaissance that really predate Christianity. 
and really give a much more nuanced discussion of, of morals and ethics um, than anything you find in the Bible. Now, would you disagree with that? Um, no, I wouldn't disagree, but obviously there's, the, you know, a lot of what the Greeks did was, the, the early Greeks from classical antiquity, a lot of what they did got suppressed by the Christians when they came in and started yeah. suppressing all of the, the pagan philosophy. So, mm -hmm. yes, there's elements of democracy that continued on, but I, I think when they talk about Western values, like they're talking about, you know, basic morality, I mean, they never really define it, do they, on what they mean specifically by uh, by Western values um, being Judeo-Christian. So if they're trying to claim that it's morality, that, you know, we don't murder people, again, that goes back to the point, those kinds of of social norms, you know, predate. I don't even. You know, I don't even mean. The, I don't even mean morality. You know, on, on a in a general sense. I mean the the values and institutions that the, the West have. You know, like freedom of uh, speech, press, religion, um, things like that. Universal rights. So, like you had the U UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Now that couldn't have very well started with an invocation to Jesus. You know, it, it appealed to a common humanity. You know, we have a common human condition and common interest. And that, that comes from the Enlightenment. Thinkers were arguing for, and you know, you notice this, <clears throat> the Christianity reigned over the Dark Ages, and they suffocated thought and, and uh, freedom. And they, you know, had the divine right of kings and um, Inquisition, Crusades. You know, Christianity was largely spread by force. You have its, it's uh, supposedly... Um, you know, illuminating figures like Augustine argued against curiosity and studying the world. Uh, Martin Luther was an anti-Semite and he was against reason. And, um, you know, Calvin burned uh, people at the stake for questioning the Trinity. Um, so in the Enlightenment is when we started getting changes. Christianity reigned for a long time before the Enlightenment. And that's when we had secular names making secular arguments. And when Christianity started losing its power, and that's when we you know, first started to see all these um, revolutions in the way people thought. So, yeah, and I know you. A, I, there's a good quote from Steven Pinker in Enlightenment Now, where he talks about that. That you know, when when we sort of look back on these on these values, like we're sort of looking at it through this lens of the Enlightenment yeah. and this sort of birth of these these ideals. So, it's yeah. I mean, it's it's obviously there's there's a lot of there are a lot of examples we could use of, you know, not so good, you know, values like the ones you mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a fallacy that the, the theists like to, to hawk that it's, it's based on, on Western values. And it's, it's been debunked by many philosophers like Daniel Dennett, like Steven Pinker. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been done to death, but it's, it's the little, you know, you sure. know, the line they like to trot out and use because they think they they think they're playing their trump card, but you know yeah. it's because you know, clearly they are picking and choosing what they you know adhere to and like. They always and do. what criteria are they using? You know what lens are they seeing that through? Yeah. Because well, they they like yeah. to think that anybody who's who doesn't have Christian morality is obviously amoral. So you know, yeah, and we just, can even find like Paul and I think Romans. He talked about everybody is equal under christ but he was talking about the next life and he was you know he taught people to stay under station in life you know he wasn't speaking in a legal sense so this this um claim just does not hold water it doesn't stand under scrutiny um so jason i know that you're big on um you're writing a book now on uh the origins of uh our modern thought our ideas of freedom things of that nature yeah, and you really get into Spinoza. Do you want to get into that a little bit? Kind of what, why Spinoza was so important? And there's many yes. Enlightenment scholars that would agree with you, like Jonathan Israel, that made kind of his ideas the foundation of a, a lot of things. Yeah. So, and that's that's the right word, foundational. That Spinoza was, he was the first to articulate a a very profound argument for a strict secular democracy. Right. Um, you know, he saw living in, in, in Holland in, you know, the 1600s, he saw like this factional infighting, you know, amongst the Dutch Reformed Calvinists um, and some of the more liberal minded 
um, theologians, some who were like arguing against the Trinity and things like that. And, and, you know, even Descartes, I think around 1653 or so, you know, yeah. it was the, one of the universities, I think, banned the teaching of Descartes' philosophy altogether. Um, and yeah, Christianity just, has a long history of banning a lot, you know, banning books and uh, burning yeah. books and things of that nature. <laughs> so, Vatican yeah, definitely. Books still prohibited books. Yeah. Yeah, so he's, he saw what was going on, you know, you know, he's, he's coming you know, a few generations after Galileo um, and Copernicus and all of these scientists. And, you know, he was, he was friends with uh, Christian Huygens and uh, he was communicating with, you know, with other scientists. And he was just, I think his, his main argument was for freedom of thought that, you know, he's sort of at the vanguard of this, the scientific revolution as, as all of these great new discoveries are starting to come in. You know, and he sees what's happened to Galileo being put under house arrest and 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 censored uh, by the Vatican. And he, I think he took great uh, umbrage at the fact that, you know, these theologians were claiming authority for themselves that, you know, there really was no basis for in the Bible. Right. And and say, you know, who are, who are these people to stifle freedom of thought and freedom of expression and and trying to handcuff all of these wonderful new scientific discoveries that were that were starting to come out in his lifetime. Like, I mean, was it Newton? Newton's Principia was published, I think, uh, within a decade or two after his his theological political treatise. Uh, so he's he's living in an era of these of these scientific giants, and you know, he's, it's post Reformation and. But still in the era where, you know, as I mentioned, Galileo was being put under house arrest. And so his whole argument in, in his theological political treatise, uh, which was sort of the first um, thoroughly modern argument for secular democracy. And right. his argument was so it, a lot of it. Uh, he, he sort of gave birth to the discipline of textual criticism. Right. So he was yeah. he was the first to really deconstruct the Bible in infinite detail. Um, like his first 14, 15 chapters are going through in, in different topics like the chosen people and prophecy. Um, he gets into the, the gram, uh, gramma, grammatical construction of, of the Hebrew language and the fact that there's no vowels. And, you know, when they started writing this stuff down, a lot of they had to make guesses at what words they were trying to use. Um, and he points to a lot of the... Uh, you know, he's, he's using the Bible as sort of as a weapon against itself by saying, you know, we can't really, if we're going to use sacred scripture as our, as our source for authority, then we can only go by what's written in the Bible. And so he really thoroughly deconstructed it. Um, what's his name? Uh, Edwin Curley uh, was talking about how uh, some of the predecessors, some of the, the, uh, European Christians, um, Vala and Erasmus, who had uh, had sort of re redone the the New Testament the way he went after the Old Testament, and right. he he said, but they they never kind of made a an index of and, and cross reference of all of the uh, biblical passages and where they line up and where they contradict. So that he was really kind of the first to to thoroughly document the Bible. Uh, and make this kind of cross-referencing. And so he would go back and use these references that could say, well, how can you say that, that the priests have authority? When you look back in the time uh, of the kings, the priests were subservient to the kings of Judah. So it's only in the Second Temple era, after the Babylonian exile, when the, the, <clears throat> the Davidic dynasty has been uh, eliminated, and the priests come back, and then the priests essentially... Um, usurp the political authority, and and so he's basically arguing, going back in into biblical history and saying, well, you know, this was kind of an anomaly that the priests kind of took took the authority. So if we're going to look to the Bible as a source of authority, then the priesthood should be subjugated to to the political authority, whether that's a king or, in his case, to an elected uh, democratic body, mm -hmm. and so his argument was the first very 
thoroughly articulated argument for a secular democracy, which then the later radical, as Jonathan Israel likes to use it, the, the yeah. radical thinkers used to to push forward this idea, mm-hmm. especially the, the French like Diderot and Dolbach, uh, and then later the Americans who, um, they kind of took it, they, they took Spinoza's, so Spinoza was an Erastian, so was Hobbes, so was Grotius and Machiavelli, and an Erastian, an Erastian doctrine means the church is subordinate to the state. Now, obviously, when you get to the founding fathers in the U.S., they're calling for separation of church and state. So that that was kind of a wholly new experiment that sort of went from Spinoza's subjugation to the state to making it uh, sort of like, you know, separate but equal, you know, the, the, the non-overlapping spheres. So yeah. that, that was kind of a new twist that they took. And uh, it's probably a better experiment than subjugating it to the state because obviously, you know, a, a state that, that's acting in bad faith could then, you know, manipulate the church uh, as, as we've seen numerous examples of. So I think it's, um, so Spinoza was, was very important from for the point for sort of being the first to articulate that need for a strictly secular democracy where the church just doesn't have any influence uh, over yeah. state policy or social policy. You know, that you are, you know, your role is basically to support people spiritually and that's it. Yeah. And people don't seem to get that secularism is about fairness. You know, it's about maintaining peace and, and uh, mutual cooperation. Uh, it's, you know, because we have a long history of, you know, whenever any religion gets power, you know, it's bloodshed, basically. Um, and we mentioned the Greeks and the Greeks democracy that wasn't obviously it was limited, very limited. Um, but, you know, even Peter Gay, who was a great Enlightenment scholar, he calls his book on the Enlightenment, the rise of modern paganism. So, you know, he traces it back to pagan ideas. And, and many people have seen this and pointed this out. So if you want to call and, and uh, so many of the Enlightenment names are not even Christians at all. They were anti-Christian, very much so, because they saw in Christianity and its institutions, things opposed to what they wanted to advocate, like, you know, freedom and um, all of that, free scientific enterprise, all of that. And so it's very interesting, um, you know, even the the Ionians, who were the pre-Socratics, you know, a lot of them were very <clears throat> naturalistic um, in their science and, and didn't include gods, and they were like the first people not to include a supernatural, you know, explanation for things. And so you had ideas like Democritus with his atomism, um, he didn't have any evidence for it, but, you know, had that idea thousands of years before it was discovered, things of that nature. And uh, your, your nickname, um, Diogenes, as a guy who, um, he, uh, thought of cosmopolitanism, he, he was pretty eccentric, you know, I believe he like defecated in the street and stuff, <laughs> but he did have yeah. ideas of, um, we take, we try to take, we recognize people are flawed and take the best of their ideas. But, um, yeah, he, he advocated like a world, uh, being a world citizen, uh, and again, the Stoics had that idea. So, uh, and people will say, you know, what are rights founded on if they're not founded on God? But Albert Einstein has a great quote uh, talking about, you know, I, the idea of human rights are not written in the stars. They're great ideas that people have thought up, you know, through observing the, the human species in its condition and what works best through history. And the tire and the struggle for them would be the ruin of civilization. And we can see, you know, we can compare and contrast, you know, where people have freedom and rights. Just uh, North and South Korea, looking at them from space, uh, one is lit up, you know, at night with activity, and the other one is completely dark. So, and obviously North Korea is, you know, while I think it's technically atheistic, it's very religious, and it, you know, copies just like Stalinism did all the worst aspects of traditional religion. You know, it's not reasonable at all. It's it's a deification of, of something and, and, and acting on faith and obedience and <clears throat> things of that nature. So, and when you mentioned um, people like Diderot and Dehobach, um, it's very interesting that, that these people were atheists. And many, uh, I think the majority really of the radical enlightenment were atheists. So, you know, they their arguments for morality were basically we have innate empathy. We're social creatures that have to live together. So I feel bad when, when uh, I treat another poorly, but also there's a self-interest there dynamic to it because 
if I treat somebody bad, they may in turn treat me poorly. So it's it's in everybody's best interest to cooperate. Um, and, you know, if we don't, we'll have ruin. And uh, that's not the way to go. I mean, it's a little bit on the lines of common sense, but uh, common sense in, in some matters really often seems to escape people. What are some other Enlightenment names that you uh, that you really uh, like or, or think are very uh, important? Well, I'm, I'm just still getting into the research. I've only done one chapter so far, but uh, one of the ones I'm really looking forward to is, is David Hume uh, and obviously getting more into to Diderot and Dolbach because uh, I'm, I'm going to do the book chronologically. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, obviously they're going to come later. I and just read so, a book uh, by Diderot, one of his first uh, books called The Skeptic's Walk, Skeptic's Walk and I, I really recommend it. It's, uh, it's uh, basically three parts. The first part is talking about religion, is walking through the Valley of Thorns. And then the middle part is the Valley uh, of uh, Chestnut Trees and is the ph ph philosophers. And so like they walk along the path of chestnut trees, that, you know, discussing philosophical ideas. And so already, this is in 1947, you have ideas of uh, Spinoza, a pantheism being expressed. And there's an atheist there, and there's also like a deist there, and they're like arguing. And um, Voltaire sent a uh, Reddit, I believe, uh, and he was asking Diderot about his thoughts, and, and Diderot very courageously in that letter said, expressed basically Spinoza's ideals, you know, that, that uh, motion is innate in matter and uh, things like that. Then the last part of that book is about uh, the valley of something. I forget what it's called, but it's about like just pleasure seeking people that take the path of just pleasure seeking. So you have the path of thorns, which is religion, then philosophy, then just pure pleasure. But it's a really good book. And you can uh, read in his um, letter to the blind, which he got in prison for, um, which really shocked him. And he like the rest of his stuff, he, he published uh, secretly or didn't publish it. He just spread it among friends. Uh, the letter on the blind has a completely, explicitly evolutionary um, part in it. There's a guy named Saunderson who's blind, and there's a, like a priest that comes to him on his deathbed, wanting him to accept the argument from design and become a theist, basically. And Saunderson's talking about he 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 expounds complete, I mean, almost exactly natural selection that you know a hundred more than a hundred years before Darwin. <laughs> so that's pretty incredible. Uh, so even more than the philosophical, ethical, um, governmental aspect of the Enlightenment. You have people that are have proto-evolutionary ideas. Really, they, 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 they uh, capture the exact insight that Darwin had about natural selection, things like that. So that's very cool stuff to read about. Um, I, would, I would recommend, if so any of your, your fans that are watching this, I read two years ago, I read uh, The Origin of Species and The Descent of Man. And to read it from, you know, our modern perspective where, you know, we know about genetics and, you know, all of the, the evidence we've collected since he wrote it. And right. the things that he was, he was speculating on just from observation, he said, well, you know, you know, we should find this. And, you know, you, you read it now and think, well, you know, he kind of wrote this in the dark. And it's just mind blowing, like how how dead on he was. So, uh, you know, if, if no one's ever read it, you know, it's 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 really worth a good read. It's it's a fantastic book. Actually, both of them are. So. I've never actually read it, not all the way through. So but yeah, that's a, I think I might do that sometime. But any other enlightenment names you want to throw out before we uh, wrap up, Jason? Uh None that I, none that are like jumping to mind. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, doing a bit more on Machiavelli. I mean, I know he's known for the Prince, um, but he, he's not he really also, Enlightenment. He's more Renaissance. Uh, yeah, but he, well, even Spinoza's not considered Enlightenment. Um, he's oh, it depends on who, it depends on what author you go to, because yeah. people will but, date the, yeah, they'll date it differently. So Machiavelli's mostly known for the Prince, but he also did. He influenced Spinoza, like some of his points come up in Spinoza. He was an Erastian as well. Uh, yep. So even though I wrote I wrote Spinoza first, um, just because I I had read uh, I read Hobbes, Leviathan, and I read Spinoza, so I wanted to write that first. It was still was kind of fresh in my head. So I'm actually going to jump back um, into the Greeks and do a bit um, um, on the um, 
you know, like the Ionians and the Socratics and the right. Stoics and all these people, and then jump into what happened, you know, after the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of Vatican authority, and then sort of move into uh, the Renaissance and the Reformation, uh, you know, then and then sort of catching up again to Hobbes and Spinoza. So I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to Machiavelli because there's I've seen some interesting points um, in Spinoza uh, that were you know they were footnoted by uh, by Edwin Curley. Uh, right. So I'm looking forward to to reading that because I said most people think of him as as you know the writer of the Prince, but they don't think of him sort of as this uh, as an atheist who's who's championing um, secularism. So I'm kind of looking forward to digging into that and seeing where yeah. that goes. I don't really think I've heard a perspective on Machiavelli. Um, I have heard he suggested that he and it like his Prince, he's telling the people kind of what to watch out for more than advocating, you know, a nefarious you know, yeah. ruthless prince. Yeah, and the yeah. Thing, I, I read the I read the prince a couple of years ago, and I didn't see that that either. I didn't, you know, maybe I missed it. Maybe I was daydreaming yeah. when I was when I skimmed over. But I I never really got the sense that he was advocating for this um, that sort of you know draconian system that he's he's been labeled with. So right. maybe people have misinterpreted him, or maybe I just maybe I missed it, but I didn't see it. So. Yeah. One final point that I want to make about the French Revolution. Uh, a lot of people point to that and say, oh, look, the Enlightenment got us that. And atheism got us that. But, you know, the leader of the Reign of Terror was Robespierre. And he was a staunch anti-atheist figure. Um, he even, like, uh, he created this uh, festival of the Supreme Being to counter the atheism and the revolution. But the atheists, like, like Condorcet and others... That really were involved in the um, you know, rights of man, or the uh, what do you call it? the Declaration of the Rights of Man, whatever it was called, you know, the fraternity, liberty, equality, those principles. They were atheists. Uh, so the guy that really presided over the reign of terror was a staunch anti-atheist, and that's that's worth noting <laughs> because people like to make that point, which is a fallacious yeah. point. One of the points that's in my notes that'll go in the book is that a lot of Americans like to cite Thomas Paine and, you know, the age of reason and common sense. And, oh, oh yeah. he's, he, he's advocating for this, but he was still he was still a deist. And yeah. there's several quotes uh, in my notes from him where yeah. he's, he's denigrating atheists because he saw what happened during the reign of terror and, and you know, the, the what was going on with the atheists in the French Revolution. And he was. He was really rather dismayed by what he saw. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was a great so quote by um, Thomas Thomas Jefferson in, in a letter to Thomas Law. I think it's 1814, and he points out that you know if love of God was the foundation of morality, look at all these atheists that were like the best, most virtuous men. And he mentioned by name Diderot, De Holbach, Condorcet, De Alembert. Um, you know, so obviously the love of God can't be the foundation of morality. You know, even Thomas Jefferson knew. Maybe this escaped Thomas Paine. I don't know. Um, I don't remember him talking about he, he advocated for the French Revolution. You know, he wrote The Rights of Man and like the, the staunch conservative Ed, Edmund Burke <clears throat> wrote opposing him. So I don't remember. I, don't, I haven't come across that with Paine talking about atheists causing the French Revolution or, or the reign of terror or anything like that. He wrote a whole book arguing for the French Revolution, <clears throat> just like Thomas Jefferson supported it. But um, yeah, but even Jefferson knew, you know, that these guys these big um, philosopher, atheist philosophers, they were extremely virtuous, you know, good people. But yeah, Thomas Thomas Paine is a, a big name and he makes a lot of good arguments and the, and, uh, the age of reason. Like, for example, um, on Revelation, you know, was, for the first... He's not an atheist, though. And that's yeah, he's a, not, lot of people, not, a lot of people yeah. assume he was, but no, he wasn't. I think Teddy Roosevelt called him a dirty little atheist or something. Yeah, but he wasn't an atheist. He was a deist, but <clears throat> he makes a lot of good points. Um, like the revelation uh, after the first communication, it's only hearsay. So, you know, you, all you have to take it is on, on the word of somebody. You heard it from some, somebody. You heard it from somebody. And, you know, uh, he made a lot, of, a lot of good points in that, that book, which I have, um, definitely. And uh, I, I've read a lot into the Founding Fathers. And if you read through the, the letters of Thomas Jefferson and, and others, you know, this, it's very obvious. These people are products of the Enlightenment and they're free thinkers and, and religious skeptics. And Jefferson sometimes bashed Christianity completely. He didn't believe in any part of it. Um, so, yeah, that's very interesting. Well, Jason, uh, thank you so much for your time. 
Um, you're doing good work with the uh, Atheist um, Alliance International. There's a lot of bloggers and people still in jeopardy, like it, the guy in Africa, the uh, head of a humanist organization. I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, hopefully that turns out well. That's that's. I mean, that's atrocious. That's insane. But uh, you keep fighting the good fight, and uh, um, I'll nice. look forward to reading your work um, when you get it finished. And thank you for, yeah. for joining me today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much. Alrighty. Thanks. Take care.